All right, Ben Aldridge, welcome to the show. Hi, Brett. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure to be able to chat to you today. So you've published a book, How to Be Uncomfortable with Being Uncomfortable, 43 Weird and Wonderful Ways to Build a Strong, Resilient Mindset. And in this book, you highlight 43 different things that people can do to be uncomfortable and hopefully get comfortable with being uncomfortable. But the impetus behind this book is interesting because it's about your story, your history, your struggle with anxiety and panic attacks. So tell us about that story. When did you start noticing you have problems with anxiety and panic attacks? And, um, and then for those who haven't experienced a panic attack, like what does it feel like? Yeah, sure. So all of this is off the back of that, as you said, that anxiety. And uh, seemingly out of the blue, a couple of years ago, I was hit with severe and debilitating anxiety. And I didn't know what was happening at the time. I had no education on mental health. So I honestly thought I was dying. It was really, really overwhelming experience. And it was very physical. So my heart would be racing, my hands would be shaking, I'd be feeling sick. And there was just this underlying sense of fear all the time. And there was no reason to be afraid. And that's the thing that was so bizarre about it. There was no trigger and nothing had happened to cause this. It literally came out of the blue. So this really did knock me for six and I had no tools in place to deal with it. So the whole journey has come off the back of this, uh, learning to manage my anxiety and, and, and figure out what was happening. And so to, to figure out what was happening, you started, you started doing some heavy bibliotherapy. So you started reading books, of, you know, psychology books about cognitive behavioral therapy, about anxiety, you even studied philosophy. But in the beginning of the book, you talk about some of the big ideas that you took away from different modalities, philosophies to help you deal with your anxiety. And surprisingly, one of the most helpful things for me wasn't particularly psychology, but it was philosophy. It was Stoic philosophy. But what was the big idea from Stoic philosophy to help you start to get a handle on your anxiety? So yeah, Stoicism was a really key philosophy and set of ideas that just really helped me. And at the time, to deal with all of this, I went to the doctor who initially had diagnosed me with anxiety. And I was given a few things that I could do. But for me, educating myself was the number one thing that I wanted to do. I needed to understand what's happening. And that's, as you said, that's when I got into extensive reading on all these different subjects and I started picking ideas from different places. But Stoicism was the one that really clicked with me. And I do write a lot about some of these other philosophies and concepts from Buddhism to cognitive behavioral therapy and mindset. Uh, growth mindset and fixed mindset. And these ideas really, really helped. But stoicism was the one that just, yeah, really resonated with me and allowed me to kind of actively fight back against my anxiety. And the key concept that really got everything going was uh, the idea of practicing adversity, which is so counterintuitive when you're in a, a kind of anxiety hole and you're in a very dark place. The idea is that by practicing adversity, you prepare for adversity. And the Stoics used to deliberately step outside of their comfort zones in order to build resilience. And they did this in so many different interesting ways. So they'd expose themselves to the cold, to the heat, they'd sleep on the floor without, or like on hard surfaces, and they would fast from food and water. And there was one stoic, Cato, who used to wear, he used to wear things to embarrass himself so that he could practice shame. And I love this idea of training I knew that you go to the gym to train your body, but I hadn't really considered where you go to train your mind. And the Stoics were doing this thousands of years ago. And that really connected with me. So that was a, a huge thing. And I started to create my own challenges based off the, the Stoics and then based on things that would push me out of my comfort zone in order to see if that would help me to deal with my anxiety and also to be able to put in place systems to to face that anxiety and, and to be able to to deal with things when they come up. So that's really what changed everything for me when I encountered this concept. No, yeah, and we'll, uh, we're going to talk about some of the challenges that you did to help you with dealing with your anxiety, and a lot of them were inspired directly from the Stoics. And I think it's interesting that with the Stoics, I don't, I think they counterintuitive or just sort of intuitively figured out some aspects of 
cognitive behavioral therapy that we figured out, you know, millennia later after stoicism came on the scene. And one thing that we've learned with treatments for anxiety is that exposure therapy is one of the best things you do. Instead of hiding or running away from the thing that makes you uncomfortable or and triggers the anxiety attack, what a lot of therapists recommend for people who deal with anxiety is exposing themselves to that thing so that they get habituated to it and they learn how to manage or the, the, the emotions and feelings that they get come up when they have that trigger. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that we don't even need to be anxious people to benefit from this system of fear exposure. And in my book, I talk a little bit about how I created these challenges. And one concept which is very relevant to what we're talking about now is the idea of an anti-bucket list. Now, we all know what a bucket list is. That's where you want to do these things before you die. You want to go to Vegas or maybe you want to go and, I don't know, sleep in the desert. There's loads, loads of different things that you would want to do. The idea of the anti-bucket list is that there are things that you definitely don't want to do before you die. And as adults, it's very easy for us to avoid them. And this is this is something that we can play with and we can create challenges and things around this. And the anti-bucket list is essentially a load of things that we don't want to do. And we can use that to test ourselves and to challenge ourselves. And this is something that the Stoics would absolutely agree with and something that they would they would be behind. And I love this concept. So the anti-bucket list is something that has helped me to, to create challenges that we'll talk about later, I guess. But it's, it's a fun concept. So another philosophy that you found useful was Buddhism. And what's interesting about Buddhism, there's a lot of similarities between it and Stoicism. But what was the big idea from Buddhism that you took away that kind of helped you not only create your, your, this year of adversity, these challenges you did, but also just help you manage your anxiety on a day-to-day basis? Yeah, so Buddhism is a, an amazing philosophical system for dealing with life. And I'm not a Buddhist, but I really like a lot of the concepts within Buddhism. And the one, the one that really resonated with me was the concept of meditation and mindfulness. And I found that that's very helpful when facing fear and dealing with anxiety. The concept of trying to be more present and focusing on my breathing has been very helpful. And I've managed to test that out in lots of different settings. And I, I know that it works for me. So focusing on my breath is really important. And the idea of impermanence as well within Buddhism, that everything changes. And whatever we're facing at the moment, it will change. It's the one guaranteed thing in life is that everything changes. So focusing on that concept and exploring that a little has been very helpful, actually, knowing that even if you're in a bad place, that things will change. It's not always going to be like this. And then finally, you looked at cognitive behavioral therapy. And we've had people on the podcast talk about cognitive behavioral therapy. But what's interesting about it uh, is that it actually, with with science and research, has confirmed some of these practices or ideas that the Stoics and Buddhists figured out thousands of years ago. But was there a particular idea from cognitive behavioral therapy that you found useful in helping you manage your anxiety? Yeah, for the, for the anxiety, just blasting my thoughts with logic. Whenever something comes up and it's always that negative self-talk that can help to spiral when you're in a, you know, an anxious situation and your mind can make things so much worse. So cognitive behavior therapy is all about questioning those thoughts and really like blasting everything with logic. And that really helps if you question it enough, question those uh, negative thoughts and that, that kind of internal dialogue that's not doing you any favors blast it with logic and actually you'll find that a lot of the time it's not rooted in logic so this does this does help and the more you do it i think the more automatic it becomes at first it's very counterintuitive i guess but over time you become better at doing it and that's something that i've really well, that's really helped me so like what's an example of that that you saw in your own life i mean what would be like a trigger that you'd have that would sort of spark an anxiety attack and then what would you do with the cognitive behavioral therapy to challenge that that feeling Okay, so I think I'll, I'll give you an example of, so when I'm climbing, okay, so I, I do a lot of climbing and mountaineering. And I still feel fear when I'm at, at height. So I can, I get sweaty hands and it's having to deal with that. But it's constantly leaning into the logical side of the process. Like when I'm climbing at the gym and if I'm lead climbing and I'm quite high up, I have to really question this negative thought pattern in my mind which is telling me that oh okay this is a dangerous situation I have to counter that and and really lean into the logic that actually I know what I'm doing and this is very safe it's a very controlled environment I've 
spent a long time learning this craft and it really leaning into the safe, the health and safety, I guess, that side of it, really focusing on that and countering that internal talk. And that's just an example of something that I guess that's an ongoing thing because I continue to climb. It's a big part of my life. But using that logic in settings like that when I feel afraid, that's very helpful. So I can, I can focus on that. that. That's one example, I think. So you uh, did all this research. I mean, it's funny, you mentioned Vegas as people going on the bucket list. You actually talk about in the book, you had your big, big panic attack when you were in Vegas in the United States. And that's when it really kicked off everything and your whole research into anxiety and how to manage it. And then after this research, you decided, okay, I'm going to start you know, from the Stoics, from the Buddhists, from this cognitive behavioral therapy, I'm going to do the things that make me uncomfortable so that I can get comfortable with the, the those feelings of anxiety that I get. So you have this idea, I'm going to do this year of adversity. And I, as I said, I think a lot of this inspiration came from the Stoics who were doing all this stuff, sleeping on the floor, exposing themselves to the cold, wearing ridiculous clothes. So we're going to talk about some of the challenges in specific, but when you when you were crafting this year of diversity, how did you figure out what sorts of challenges you were going to do? Like, how how did you figure out like what sorts of challenges to do, and like how did you know that they were challenging enough or not challenging enough? Yeah, so there was a real mix with that. What I wanted to do was push myself in different directions. So I knew that you can physically ch- challenge yourself, and that's going to do one thing. But there's also academic ways to challenge yourself, intellectual ways, mentally, you can make yourself uncomfortable. So I had these categories and there are three categories in the book that I talk about, mental, physical, and skill. And these are just the kind of broad categories that I would use to brainstorm different ideas and create potential challenges. And then, then it was about seeing what's realistic because some of, some of them are massive. Some of the things that I ended up committing to are huge, like life changing, really daily, like daily committing challenges that are very, very big. And other ones were really small. And I think it was important having that mix and punctuating my year and my life with challenges that were, that ranged in commitment. Because if, if you bite off too many big challenges, it can be overwhelming and I don't think you'll be able to achieve. So it was important to have a mix. And to explore the the different kinds of things that naturally crop up when you have a more committing challenge. But also, there's a lot to be said for a very short five minute challenge before you go to work or sort of like somewhere that you can insert a challenge into your day. I kind of like that having a balance and playing around with it. So after you, you did this for a year, I mean, after you did this year of challenges, I mean, was that did you notice a big difference? Was it like night and day, or was the improvement like more subtle? I, the, the improvement was, yeah, I guess it's been gradually the confidence like compounds over time. The more you do these, sure, the more I did these challenges, the more confident I became. And, and I stopped having panic attacks. I stopped, like, I started to understand how my mind was working and I gained control of myself. And I started, as soon as that happened, as soon as the panic attacks stopped, I knew that there was value in this concept. And, it was a, uh, it's been quite an amazing process. And although in the book, I talk about a year of adversity because I did it, I did a year really to test out this concept, but now it's something that I continue to do. And there's lots of things and lots of challenges that I, I have in my life. And I've got a long list of things I want to do. So I would say that it's a lifestyle, but that's probably a bit pretentious, but it's a, uh, it's something that I can, it's a continual thing. Um, the, the year was like kicking it off, testing it out to see if it worked and if it would help with the anxiety. And when I saw that it did, it's become a permanent part of my life. Well, you said, uh, you no, no more panic attacks, but you still deal with some anxiety. You mentioned the rock climbing, you get sort of fear of heights still, but it sounds like you're better able to handle those emotions, those intense emotions when they do crop up. Oh, a hundred percent. Yes. And I, I wouldn't say that I'd never have a panic attack again in the future, but I think the, the key for this whole project has been learning how to deal with that. And I guess pushing myself in a con- relatively controlled environment has allowed me to test out all these different ideas from philosophy and psychology and the ones that work and resonate with me. I keep them. And now I have a set of tools and tricks that I can use when things get challenging and life throws curveballs at you. And that's really been the key take home from it. And yes, uh, I, obviously I can still get anxious, but I've got systems and ideas in place to help me deal with that, which is a massive change from when I first 
started experiencing anxiety and panic attacks so yeah it's been a profound difference and that's why i'm excited to be talking about this and sharing it and writing about it all right so let's talk about some of these specific challenges because this is a lot of fun and the one the first one you start off the book with is is inspired directly from the stoics it was embrace the cold now it doesn't talk about you, you didn't go out in the winter and just sort of roll around the snow what you did to embrace the cold is take cold showers. So what was the big takeaway from this? What was your experience like with it? And how did this help you with your bigger goal of managing uh, discomfort? Yeah. So the cold showers are great because it's uh, it's now a daily ritual for me. And it's something that I wake up and it's the, one of the first things I do. And it's always, it's dealing with that mental resistance. Don't want to get into the cold because your body, <laughs> there's, there's that kind of there's a, a, an element of pain associated with the cold. So your brain is telling you that you shouldn't do it. And actually fighting back against that is, is all about self-control. So that's really one of the key take-homes from this particular challenge. And the after effects, you feel incredible from being in the cold and exposing yourself to the cold. The, that kind of endorphin boost that you get afterwards. And just the element of discipline, being able to pay attention to your mind and force yourself to do something that your mind is telling you that this is a bad idea. That's quite, quite good to be able to play around with that because it's self-discipline that that's helping to cultivate. And so do you, do you do like the way a lot of people do cold showers, they'll start off warm and then kind of gradually take it down to cold. So that it's sort of like the, the frog, you know, boiling the frogs, but in reverse. (laughs) So I imagine you recommend you start off cold and just jump right in. Yeah, just cold the whole way. That's that's that's, that's the, the worst. The, the best way to do it, it's the and worst. then you can I take did... it further as well. You can. Yeah, how do you, how would you take it further? How, I mean, how did you do that? So I, I've been. I, do, I like do a lot of wild swimming, uh, and in the UK, the sea's pretty cold. So if you're swimming in winter, then that's brutally cold. But lots of cold baths, and then taking it further with ice baths. And I've been ice swimming in Finland. That was probably one of the the most bizarre experiences I've had. And that was that was brutally cold in a frozen lake, swimming, and that, that's that's really tough. But it, it's a it's an interesting thing to play around with, and I've had a lot of fun with it. When you did the ice swimming, did you jump in a sauna afterwards? That's oh yeah, thing. absolutely. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Had, had to do that because it's just so yeah, so cold. You know what's interesting about the cold showers? I've been doing them for a while too, but even today, I mean, after years of doing this, it still is. That you still get that that sort of that clinch factor yeah. right right before you get into the cold shower. Like you, for some reason, I haven't, I still haven't gotten used to it. It's just like my body's like, no, this is not going to be comfortable. But then, as you said, after you do it, you start feeling better and you feel great after the shower. Yeah, absolutely, and that's uh, that's it really. And it's just a small win, isn't it? It's it's not a big challenge in the sense that it's not going to take up a lot of time. But yeah, it just it's. Uh, it's something I'm really, I'm trying to convince my mom to give it a go. She's very <laughs> open-minded, but she's, this is the one thing that she's, uh, she's not interested in joying. And uh, I, my theory is that if I talk about it enough, whenever I do podcasts and like interviews, if I keep going on about my mom, not getting into the cold shower, hopefully that's going to be inspiration for her to, to give it a try. To go do it. So another challenge you did was you went on a 106 mile walk hike. So first off, like why, what were you hoping to get out of this experience? And then talk about the logistics of like, how long did it take you? How did you feel afterwards? Did you want to die? What was going on with that? <laughs> this was a really hard challenge. This was a physical challenge. So this was exploring a different side of the, the challenge dynamic. And I guess that I just wanted to push myself physically. And I've always wanted to do this route. It's called the Cotswold Way. It stops in Chipping Camden. It's kind of in the middle of the UK and it goes all the way to Bath. It's 106 miles. It's really hilly. It's probably about 4,000 meters of ascent in total, which is pretty high. And every day was about a marathon, maybe longer than a marathon. And it took, I can't remember the exact amount of time it took, but most days were 10 to 12 hours of walking. So it was, it's just the kind of relentless nature of it. It's so difficult. The first day you're excited and it's, it's okay because it's, you know, day one, but day two, you wake up and your body is in bits and you know, you've got another three days to do afterwards. And so it was just that fighting against that, that pain and, and also just pushing myself, developing the endurance. And I think the thing with this challenge is I totally underestimated it because I'd run a marathon recently. That, and that was one of the other things I'd never run a marathon before. So. 
I got into running and I, uh, I did my first marathon, which was huge. So I just assumed that walking, you know, walking for four days wouldn't be a problem. But actually, it surprised me. I think uh, I didn't have enough respect for that. And uh, yeah, it was really, really difficult on the, that fourth day as well. And I really hurt my my Achilles tendon afterwards. Um, I did complete it though. And uh, it was a lot of uh, sort of get on with it, get your head down. But it did, yeah, it taught me a lot as well doing that. And it was a very physical challenge. That was one of the harder ones, I think. Actually, when I look back on it, I think time has softened how difficult it was. No, yeah, I think we've talked about on the site this. There's this thing that Teddy Roosevelt and then later JFK picked up is like this 50 mile march, and we've had people do it. And it was one of the yeah. They all say the same thing. It's like, oh, it's just walking for 50 miles. It's not bad. But then at, by the end of it, like they're just destroyed. <laughs> like for yeah. for days, there's just like they un- yeah, like they said they underestimated how hard it was going to be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing with walking. It's very easy to to yeah underestimate it so it, it was a it was a great challenge and a great way for me to push myself and it was a pretty pretty awesome experience would you ever do it again oh yeah absolutely yeah okay absolutely yeah well, that's good so let's talk about another challenge so we talked about physical challenges so far one challenge you decided to do in year is to learn a foreign language but not just any foreign language like you know spanish or french or portuguese those are latin those are kind of they're they're difficult but not they're pretty easy. You decided to learn Japanese. So how were, were you able to successfully become fluent in Japanese in a year? And what did that challenge teach you? So after a year of Japanese, I'm nowhere near being fluent, but I've learned so much during the process. I'm still not fluent, but it's something, it's an ongoing process. And I, the kind of level I'm at is, I guess you could say everyday conversation. I can speak, I, all my lessons are on Skype. And they're an hour long and I don't use English. So there's enough for me to be able to communicate and understand a lot. And I went to Japan at the end of last year and my experience was completely different from all my previous experiences in Japan. And I set myself the challenge of not using Japanese, uh, sorry, not using English when speaking to anyone in Japan. So that I managed to do that. And that was incredible because it just, it was the first time I've ever been able to communicate entirely in a second language uh, when on holiday in a in a country that doesn't speak English. So that was a huge achievement for me. And yeah, it's just been a constant a constant leveler, I guess, because it's it's so brutally hard and it's so different from English, the grammatical construction and all of the kanji characters, the Chinese characters that they use. There's thousands that you have to learn and they've got multiple different pronunciations depending upon context and it's a, it's a really complicated language. So it's, a, it's that kind of learning to have the right mindset when you're dealing with failure because learning Japanese is just constantly failing. And that's not necessarily a bad thing for us to, to learn how to manage that and deal with it. But it's been very rewarding to be able to at least be able to communicate in a, a second language. I was terrible at languages at school. So this was kind of fighting back against that self-limiting belief and and working on mindset. So I had a, I've had a lot of fun with this and it's been a really yeah, really interesting experience. Yeah, so we it's another th- idea that you took a lot from or from psychology was this mindset theory from Carol Dweck. We've had her on the podcast talk about that that idea of that there's two types of mindsets, there's fixed mindset and uh, growth mindset. And I think a tendency for a lot of people is to have that fixed mindset. It's like, well, I I stink at Japanese. I'll always stink at Japanese and I'm just going to give up. Why bother? But what Dweck has found is that people with a growth mindset, it's like, well, I don't know Japanese yet. And if I work at it, I can get better. That can allow people to do more than they think they were capable of doing. Yeah, absolutely. And I, her book and her work is incredible and has had a real effect on me. And yeah, using that attitude when learning another language seems to be the the best way to deal with all of the inevitable obstacles. And it just makes it more rewarding. I guess it's focusing on process over results and knowing that learning something like Japanese is a really committing challenge and something that's going to take a long time. But actually within that, there's so many lessons that we can take out of it. And it's taught me so much and it's given me a lot. So it's, yeah, it's definitely worth doing. And yeah, I've, I've gained a lot of, uh, interesting. I've had a lot of interesting experiences as well in Japan. So it's uh, something that I really connect with. 
Yeah, I think the, the language learning is really a great way to explore that idea of fixed and growth mindsets. And I know that for a lot of people who are struggling with anxiety or even depression, there's a tendency to get in that fixed mindset. It's like, well, I'm a depressive. There's nothing I can do to change. So I might as well just give up. But no, the idea of cognitive behavioral therapy and mindset theory is that, okay, you might not like completely cure yourself of depression or anxiety, but there's things you can do to, to manage it. And that can give you hope. And can it help you do those things that, that we know will, will help you manage with this stuff? Yeah, absolutely. It's all about just um, being proactive, taking action. And that's, that's what's helped me as well. Just being really, I guess, probably aggressive in the way that I've tried to deal with my mental health. And I've just really tried to educate myself and, and step outside of my comfort zone and apply all of the, the philosophies and concepts that I've encountered. So another challenge is sleeping in a bivy bag. Now for Americans might not be familiar what a bivy bag is. I learned this, the idea of a bivy bag from another British person, Alistair Humphreys, the little micro, the, the micro adventure guy. Um, yeah. For those who aren't familiar with the bivy bag, what is it? And what did this experience of sleeping in a bivy bag teach you? So the bivy bag is great. It's essentially a giant bin bag that goes on the outside of your sleeping bag. So you don't need a tent when you're camping. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's waterproof and you just put it over your sleeping bag and then you can sleep on a mountain summit or by a river or on the beach or in the forest. And it's, it's enough of a protective shell to keep the elements at bay, but you're also very conscious of the elements because you've got your head poking out and it's a very wild back to basics experience, but it can be a lot of fun. And I've certainly had some interesting experiences in a bivy bag. And it's, uh, it's one of those things. It's very, in a way, it's quite stoic because it's not that comfortable. Let's be honest. It's, it's sleeping on the floor and you are exposed to the elements. And, you know, if it's a lovely summer evening and you're in a beautiful place in the countryside, it's probably not that hard. But if you're in the middle of a thunderstorm and you're on a beach and, you know, it's, it's all a bit crazy outside then that is a pretty challenging experience. So I've had both of those experiences and I think it's, it's good for us to, you know, to play around with this. And I've enjoyed the connecting with nature and actually the kind of the difficulty of it. It's not easy, but it's always novel. I'll tell you, I'll never forget uh, every single bivy that I've done. They're very memorable. So uh, yeah, I highly recommend it. It's just such a great way of uh, getting outdoors and it's a really lightweight way to move around as well. And it's, so you said, okay, you mentioned sleeping on the floor because basically when you're in a bivy bag, you're, that's what you do. You're sleeping on the ground. But another challenge you did was you just, instead of sleeping in your bed at home, you decided I'm just going to sleep on the floor like the Stoics did. What, what did you get out of that challenge and how did you think it helped you? Well, that was a, that was a ridiculous challenge. And I think the, the key with this whole project as well has been finding some things that have been ridiculous, some things are more serious. And um, it's again, yeah, it's play. Play is the key really and just exploring. But yeah, this one, literally just lie next to the bed and try not to get into the bed because the whole night is going to be uncomfortable and it's just fighting that. You know, Every part of you wants to get up and get into bed. And it's that dealing with that mental, that kind of mental resistance, isn't it? It's that fighting back against it, trying to stay in control, self-discipline in a situation. It's very easy for you to to solve that problem. And the temptation of having the bed right next to you means that it's very easy for you to solve the problem. <laughs> you just literally move less than a meter. So it's, it's really paying attention to what your mind does in these situations. And that's been the key for everything, just paying attention to what I'm thinking and, and working on that. And I think these ideas compound as well. So the more you do it, the, you know, the more comfortable it becomes. So public speaking is one of the most common fears that people have and induces anxiety, even in people who don't have problems with anxiety. Was public speaking an issue? Like, was that anxiety inducing for you? Yeah. Yeah, it was. And, yeah. Um, okay. So, so what did, what did you do to, to do public speaking? So my dad is, uh, is a, was an actor and uh, he's now a director and he works with businesses and helps people to speak. And he, He's basically the perfect person to help coach me. So he's been amazing in helping me to deal with that. And I'll never forget the first piece of advice he ever gave me. It's hilarious. He was like, when you're speaking to 
people when you're up in front of an audience and this is coming from his experience he's been on the west end stage in front of thousands of people every night for years and uh, so he knows about how to deal with that tension within your body so he said and I, honestly when he first told me this i didn't think he was being serious but he said what you need to do is put all of your tension into your bum so tight yeah tight in your buttocks as hard as you can put all of your tension into the lower half of your body and this frees up your the top half of your body, frees up your vocal cords, frees up all of that tension in the top half. If you're forcing it down into the bottom half, uh, this is going to help you with that, dealing with that stress and all of these people looking at you. And honestly, I thought he was take, I thought he was joking, but actually it does work. If you put you force your tension into the lower half of your body, I found that from when I've had to do certain things, speaking wise, it really helps because it does free up freeze up the top part of the body. And then naturally after maybe 30 seconds to a minute, you do start to relax a little bit in the environment. But it's that first moment, isn't it? When you're in the thrown into the the headlights, you've got them on you and that that's it, you know? So <laughs> I love that piece of advice. How did you, did you just like look for an opportunity to give a, a speech? Is that what, how you did this challenge? So for me, it was a work, it came up with work. So I had to figure it out and do that at work. And then, and then naturally I've been doing it more now recently when the book has come out. So I've had lots of, lots of workshops and lots of podcasts. So I've been able to practice this getting into that, that headspace and, and using it. And I'm confident that it's, uh, it's going to be a skill that, and, uh, something that I'm going to be doing a lot more of. So it's, yeah, it's been really interesting to explore. And yeah, that, that tip has been, yeah, particularly helpful. And one one way you can make this harder is do an open mic stand up comedy because that's the pressure because like you you go up there and people are expecting you to be funny and if you're not funny I mean like the that like the pressure there could just really cause people just to flounder and dealing with the discomfort of, of telling a joke that doesn't land and like being okay with that and moving on that can uh, that can make this experience a lot harder. Oh yeah, I think that sound that sounds ridiculous. I haven't done that yet. And I just think that's very, so the, the stoic that I was talking about earlier, Cato, who used to wear deliberate, like he deliberately would wear ridiculous clothes to feel shame. So this is, this is that really, isn't it? You go and you deliberately bomb at a, uh, a stand up night and you just have to deal with that feeling inside as uh, your material doesn't work. And I think that that's, that in itself could be quite an um, interesting experience. So yeah, there's loads of ways to play around with, with making public speaking harder. But I think it's a, it's an interest. Is it? Yeah, it's a fascinating skill to explore. So we mentioned earlier this idea of the anti bucket list, like doing the things you don't want to do, like doing the things that you're most afraid of. So it's like basically exposing yourself to your biggest fears. And you did this for one of your challenges. You decide I'm going to do things that I would, I would, I typically would say I would never do. So what were the fears you purposely exposed yourself and what did you get from that experience? Yeah, so the perfect example of this is uh, my very serious fear of needles, which I turned into a challenge because it's one of those things that actually, because I I don't want to do it and because there's a lot of resistance to it, there's a huge amount of growth that can actually come off the back of it if I face that fear. So I turned my fear of needles into a challenge and the challenge was to go and get acupuncture. Now, if you're afraid of needles, getting needles in your face and your stomach and your hair and your arms and your legs all over you, that's not easy. So that's, that's one of the things that I worked up to and I spent some time doing that. And yeah, I, I managed to do it and I kept doing it until it became pretty normal. So it was a, a yeah, a great way for me to deal with uh, that fear of needles and slowly exposing myself to it. Well, actually, I say that I kind of jumped in at the deep end with it and just used all of these, the tools and tricks that I've been studying to help me get through that. And then I went and just got covered in needles. And uh, yeah, it was it was a, <laughs> a funny experience. Yeah, for me, it would be like handling like tarantulas or snakes. That I mean don't don't want to do that like that's like one thing i'm not a big fan of so i'd have to it would take some uh, gumption to do that for myself yeah but i think there's a lot there's a lot that you would learn as well about yourself if you are forcing yourself to do these things and i think this uh this can be yeah 
quite an insightful experiment. So it, it, what I love is just hearing how different people respond to the anti-bucket list because everyone has different things that they find particularly challenging. Deep water is one that gets mentioned quite a lot. Swimming in the sea if you can't touch the the, the bed, the floor below you. Um, and there's other things. Yeah, insects come up all the time and heights and this, yeah, public speaking. So it, it's, I think it can be... That, yeah, there's a huge amount of room for for people to experiment with this and having a system to deal with adversity and having some tools and tricks in place can help us. And actually, we'll know that these tools work when we apply them in a controlled environment. And I guess that's a controlled environment, isn't it? We're forcing ourselves yeah. to do things that are difficult. You mentioned heights. You purposely induced vertigo in yourself. You went to Chicago and went to the... what? It's, it used to be called, I, I know it as the Sears Tower. I think it's called the Wills Tower. I mean, something different now. But there's an observatory there that you can sort of look over with the glass and it's just, it's just it induced vertigo in you. Yeah, so that was a good one because I, I do a lot of climbing, but again, I do have this thing, like I do, I have a bit of a thing with heights. So it's always been, that's always been something that I've played around with. And the Chicago Tower was just the perfect example of a, of really pushing myself because they've got these glass boxes on the outside of the tower and you can literally walk out over the streets of Chicago, hundreds of meters below you on glass. There's a couple of inches of glass below your feet. And it's a really, yeah, if you've got a problem with heights, that's uh, pretty tough. I was with my girlfriend that we were there together and, and she had no problem at all. She walked out because the, the boxes go maybe like two meters out from the side of the, the building. So she just walked out as if there was no problem at all. But when I walked out, it was just so difficult for me and my hands were just so sweaty. And yeah, that was a, a pretty memorable experience. So you did a year of this you know, intense year of adversity. Since then, like what sort of things have you done to keep up this idea of the year of adversity in your life? So naturally now it's a mix of, the things just crop up that are challenges in life. So 2020 has been filled with challenges and and it's been applying all of the things that I've learned from this experiment to real life as well. And that's been really helpful. And then also just continuing to progress with some of the other things that have uh, been, that I picked up during that year. So pushing myself with my Japanese and running races and marathons and meditating and doing all of these different things and seeking bizarre challenges. And during lockdown, I climbed Mount Everest on my stairs. I decided that because we weren't allowed to go out for, in the UK, we've had it was quite a strict lockdown for um, a couple of months. And during the peak of that, um, I decided that I was desperate to go to the mountains, but I couldn't. So I brought the mountains to me and I spent eight, I think it was seven or eight days climbing my stairs, which was the equivalent height of Everest. So I had to go up and down my stairs 2,137 times. And that was a really bizarre challenge. And I actually had a lot of fun doing it. My girlfriend was at the the table because we were both working from home. She's at the table in the front room, just working away. And then I'm just going up and down the stairs relentlessly to try and uh, complete this challenge. But that was uh, that's one thing that I've done. I ran a marathon in my garden as well during lockdown. And my garden's only seven meters long. So... That was uh, another example of something maybe a bit more bizarre. Well, I think it's a good point with the the pandemic and the shelter in place orders that we've all all have experienced to some extent. Because it, it's so easy to be like, well, I'm just going to watch Netflix and play video games and whatever. But like, I think there's something in our in us that needs that that challenge to to, to actually feel healthy and to push ourselves. And I loved how you know finding creative ways to to challenge yourself even when. You might not be able to go outside. There's still things you can do if you're creative to challenge yourself. Yeah. And I think it's important to have fun as well when you're doing it, not to take yourself too seriously because it can be a great way to connect with people. And actually, because even though I couldn't go and see anyone, I posted a few pictures on Instagram of this climb and I actually managed to get some virtual climbing partners who agreed to climb it with me, but on their stairs. And it turned into this quite fun thing. I got um, I got offered expedition support from... Uh, Sherpa support from this company that actually work in the Himalayas and loads of people were piping in with advice and stuff. And it turned into this really nice event. And actually it was something that I'm never going to forget that. 
that's uh, such a bizarre experience. But yeah, we can find challenge anywhere. I think we've just got to have the right mindset and just be open to be creative and look at different ways to push ourselves. And this whole project has been about mixing the kind of the normal challenges or the, the slightly more mainstream challenges with the bizarre and the weird and the wonderful. And it's been, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Because I think a lot of times people, they take themselves a little bit too seriously when they try to do this self-improvement stuff. Sometimes, you know, you got to have an element of play with it and be okay with feeling a little silly. You're like, well, you know, cold showers, what's that really going to do? Is that going to do anything? Well, I don't know. Give it a try. You might find out. Maybe it doesn't do anything for you, but you won't know until you until you try it. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think these ideas compound. So it might not be the cold shower that does it, but I think it's if that's one of many different things that you're doing, they all add up. And together, it's that's what makes the difference over time when you're doing and constantly seeking out challenges in different places and in different ways and different styles of pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. I think that's what makes the difference. It's not, it's not going to be one thing, you know, like, I talk about solving a Rubik's cube. It's not like you can solve a Rubik's cube and then that's it. Everything changes, but it's, it's one challenge in a list of many things that over time, if we do this, I, I believe that it teaches us about who we are and it teaches us about how to deal with difficulties and, and what works well for us when we're facing challenge. Well, Ben, this has been a great conversation. Where can people go to learn more about the book and your work? So my website benaldridge.com is a great place to start because it's got an active blog and a link to all of my social media. And Instagram is where I'm most active. The handle for that is at do things that challenge you. And that has loads of pictures from various challenges and climbs and whatnot, and lots of philosophy and quotes and things. So it's a real mix there. And if you're interested in the book, it's on Amazon. It's in lots of different bookstores. And in the US, I can't remember exactly what bookstores it's stocked in, but you should be able to find it if you, uh, if you Google it. Fantastic. Well, Ben Aldridge, thanks for your time. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you so much for having me on. It's been brilliant to, to chat to you. Thank you. My guest today was Ben Aldridge. He's the author of the book, How to Be Comfortable with Being Uncomfortable. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can find out more information about his work at his website, benaldridge.com. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash get uncomfortable, where you find links to resources. We delve deeper into this topic. 